As we look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, in verse 3 we see a major purpose of the writing of this book. We know that Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, he gets us up to the ascension of Jesus, and so he at least touches upon uh, the resurrection of Jesus. But in this book, he will elaborate upon that theme. This book will be the resurrection book of the Bible. If I was looking for a verse that I believe teaches the resurrection in one verse, I would probably pick Mark chapter 16 and verse 6, where the Bible declares simply, He is not here. He is risen. What a simple statement and yet a powerful statement of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If I was looking for a chapter that taught the resurrection of Jesus Christ, most of us would very quickly and easily go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is known as the resurrection chapter of the Bible. But if we were looking for an entire book that deals with the resurrection, we could not find a better book uh, than the book of Acts. It is a book that deals in large measure with the resurrection. It is the resurrection book of the Bible. There is an interesting question that is asked in Acts chapter 25 and verse 19. You may want to turn over there. It is a question that Festus asked about. It was a matter that was concerning him, and it's a matter that should concern us. And we should seek out the answer to it. In Acts chapter 25 and verse 19, it says concerning Festus, he had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And so he has some questions about Jesus. And primarily his questions are about the resurrection of Jesus because Paul was affirming that Jesus was alive. And he wanted to know more about that. He wanted to know more about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we should want to know more about the resurrection of Jesus because it is the foundation of our faith. We are gathered here this morning because the tomb was found empty. We're gathered here this morning because we we are convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. If Jesus died on that cross and He remains dead this morning, then we of all men are most miserable. We of all men are most miserable because we're living our lives based upon something that isn't true. We have a hope that isn't real, if that is the case. But if it is the case that that tomb was found empty and that Jesus rose from the dead, then we are of all men most happy because we possess a hope that is real hope of something beyond this world that has a foundation and substance to it. Our faith has the foundation that it needs. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, as Luke begins introducing this book, he says, "...to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God." Now here we read in one verse about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus showing Himself alive after His passion, after His suffering and death. And showing Himself alive, according to verse 3, by many infallible proofs. It isn't a single proof for the resurrection. There are many proofs of the resurrection. They are infallible proofs. They are proofs that cannot be overturned. They are substantial evidence of His resurrection. This term, infallible proofs, in verse 3, is only used one time in the New Testament, and it's right here. Strong suggests that it refers to a criterion of certainty. Infallible proofs are literally certain proofs. uh, Proofs that are firmly established. Thayer says that the word refers to that from which something is surely and plainly known, indisputable evidence. That's the evidence that we have for the resurrection. It goes beyond that which is probable. It goes beyond that which is circumstantial. It is that which has been proven. Aristotle and Plato, philosophers of the time, 
used the term to denote the strongest possible truth. In their minds, to use this word was to speak of the strongest possible truth. You could not use a stronger word to refer to evidence or proof than the one that was used right here. Notice in verse 3 that in addition to this infallible proof that is given, it says, to whom also He showed Himself alive. The word showed here is a, a very powerful word also. It is a word that means to stand beside to exhibit, to substantiate. The idea is this, that for 40 days, Jesus stood beside His disciples as proof that He'd been raised from the dead. And so for 40 days, when you saw the disciples, you saw Jesus right there with them. That was indisputable evidence of the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And clearly it made a point, made an impression on them when they had seen Him with their own eyes. Acts chapter 10, verses 39 through 42. Here is Peter preaching. He's preaching on the resurrection as he was on Pentecost Day says in verse 39, And we are witnesses of all things which He did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed Him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. And He commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is He which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To Him give all the prophets witness that through His name, whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. Now notice in verse 40 that God raised Him up and showed Him openly. The word openly here means to put on exhibit. God put His Son on exhibit. Sometimes exhibits will come to cities. I remember that the Dead Sea Scrolls, when I was living in Crossville, Tennessee, came close to Crossville, and I was able to go over and see those Dead Sea Scrolls. They were put on exhibit. I was able to look inside of a glass case and see that evidence of the preservation of God's Word, that proof of that these things had been written and that they had been preserved for us. It's interesting to be able to see that on exhibit. It was faith-building to be able to see that. Well, when we think about Jesus Christ, God put Jesus on exhibit. For 40 days, men could see Jesus. For 40 days, they had the opportunity to examine Him, to look upon Him as closely as they wanted to look upon Him. Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 22, and I love the words of Paul because Paul is certainly convinced of the resurrection. We'll talk about that more as we move through our lesson this morning. Paul was not always a believer in the resurrection. Of course, before his conversion, he disputed whether or not Jesus had been raised from the dead, denied that Jesus had been raised from the dead. In Acts chapter 26, though, he has been fully convinced, and he is convincing others. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 22, here he is going to talk to Agrippa. He says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come that Christ should suffer and that He should die, that that He should be the first, that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Verse 24. And as He thus spake for Himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But He said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the King knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him 
For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Notice that Paul's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he says concerning that, this thing was not done in a corner. This was not something that was done in private or in secret. This is something that was done openly. And Paul says to Agrippa, you know this. You know this isn't a secret thing. You know the reports of this. You've had people tell you this. You've been briefed on this, Paul says. This isn't something that was done secretly or in a corner. It's interesting... We interpret the words of Agrippa in verse 28 in different ways, where Agrippa says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And we, we usually use it to suggest that Agrippa was close to obeying the gospel. I'm not convinced that he was. Uh, the larger context would suggest that he wasn't close at all to becoming a Christian. He knew these things. He could not deny these things. They were not hidden from him. But if you look at him in the context, in verse 25, he said, I am not mad, that's Paul's answer, most noble Festus, because that's what Festus had accused him of. He said, Thou art beside thyself, in verse 24. Much learning doth make thee mad. Paul, you're crazy. Paul, you're mad. You're talking about something that I, I don't accept, something that I don't believe. You're beside yourself. But Paul wasn't beside himself. Paul wasn't mad. Paul was simply convinced that Jesus had been raised from the dead and he had good reason for that. It's interesting that when the Bible says that God showed Jesus openly, that included the fact that men were able to handle Jesus. They were able to reach out and touch Jesus. He was a hands-on exhibit in that sense. Most exhibits that I've seen of anything that are precious are exhibits where whatever it is is behind glass and you can't touch it. You could look at it and that's impressive and it's, it's something that, that I enjoy doing, but I can't reach out and put my hands on it. But this was a hands-on exhibit. People were able to examine his wounds. In Luke chapter 24, if you'll go there for just a minute, you'll see what the disciples were able to do Luke 24 and verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. But he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said to them, Have ye here any meat? They gave him a piece of broad fish and of a an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Now notice that Jesus says, Handle me. Examine me in the closest of ways to make sure that, that I am here, that I am alive, and he even ask for meat, which would be convincing evidence for them. Uh, that he was alive, because the Spirit would not have needed or wanted that. But he did that to substantiate the fact that he had been raised from the dead. John chapter 20, if you'll go there for just a minute, Jesus invited them to touch and to handle him, and we have to believe that they took Jesus up on that. John chapter 20 and verse 19, Then this, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, 
came Jesus and stood in the midst, saith unto them, Peace be unto you. I want to make a point here in verse 19. The disciples are assembled, and what day is it? First day of the week. We're seeing a pattern even before Acts chapter 2 of the day upon which they meet. This is a special day for them. It has been a special day for them since the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So we see this pattern that's developing and that will continue, continues even down to today. Verse 20, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. They thought their Lord and their friend was gone forever. And here he stands in their midst. And he's inviting them to look at his hands, to look at his side, to examine the evidence. He wants them to see the evidence. Now, if anyone in the first century world would have known whether or not this was Jesus, it would have been the disciples. They spent more time with Him than anyone else. They were closer to Him than anyone else was. If anyone could tell whether this was an imposter or this was really Jesus raised from the dead, it was these men. Jesus showed Himself to them. And they were fully convinced that He'd been raised from the dead. And the way that I know that they were fully convinced is the fact that they later would give their lives for preaching this very truth. Now, if they had not been convinced that the one who had stood in their midst and who had spent 40 days with them was the resurrected Christ, they would not have been willing to give their lives for it. If you're willing to give your life for something, then you are fully convinced of it. That does not necessarily mean it's the truth. Uh, There are radical extremists in the world that are willing to give their lives for something. doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth, but it does mean that they are firmly, fully convinced of it. And the apostles were firmly and fully convinced of it. But evidence beyond that will prove that it was true. But clearly they were convinced of its truth, and they were in the best position to know. Notice in John chapter 20 and verses 24 through 29... But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus... The doors being shut, it stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Here's Thomas. He missed the first occasion, but he's not going to miss this occasion. He's there. And as soon as he sees Jesus, Jesus speaks to him directly. And he says, Thomas... Thomas, I know what you said to the disciples. Oh, I wasn't there. But Thomas, I know you said that you wanted to put your finger into the nail prints. Thomas, I know you said you wanted to reach your hand into my side. Well, that was all the evidence that Thomas needed to know that this was the Lord. After all, how how would the Lord know of this unless he was the Lord? who could read the hearts and the minds of men. In verse 28, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. I don't know whether or not Thomas touched the nail print. I don't know whether or not Thomas reached his hand into the side of Christ. He certainly had the opportunity to do that. Jesus had invited them to handle him. He could have done that. But Thomas was firmly and fully convinced. And as you can see from the context, Thomas was not one to be easily convinced. He was not one who was going to be convinced merely on the testimony of someone else. He wanted to see it with his own eyes. Why do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe in part because Thomas believed. 
because Thomas was convinced. Thomas represented the doubter. He represented the one that had to have hard evidence. And he was presented with that, and he didn't balk at it. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, Notice the language that John later would use. It's beautiful language to talk about the resurrection and to talk about this convincing proof of the resurrection. The Gospel of John, as well as the book of John, begins with uh, the eternal existence of Jesus. Remember that John begins with, in the beginning was the Word. Here is what he begins this epistle with. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, just as they were overjoyed when they saw Jesus raised from the dead, He wants these Christians to feel that same joy, so He wants to tell them about it, convince them of it. He talks about in verse 2, the life was manifested or literally made known. He said again in the last part of that verse, was manifested or made known unto us. He says in verse 1, we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. And notice the combination there. We've seen it and we've looked upon Him. John wants to make a point here. And the idea of looked upon is literally we, we studied Him. We didn't merely see Him, but we gazed on Him. We stood and, and, and studied Him, examined Him very, very closely. Now, in Acts chapter 1, later on, when Jesus ascends from them, the, the angel is going to say to them, Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? They were standing there and they were wide-eyed and they were amazed by what they saw. You can imagine how they must have been studying the ascension as it took place, trying to soak in every detail of that. But the same thing is true here of the resurrection of Christ. They're soaking in all of the details. They are studying that. It refers to a steady, penetrating gaze. It's the idea of examining something until all of its characteristics are noted. A young lady is given an engagement ring. She's given it. She's overjoyed uh, by that. But in, then later in the hours that she has when she's by herself, she's able to turn it in the light and look at it this way and then look at it that way and to take it off and to turn it around and examine it from every angle in every way, to admire it in every way. They had that opportunity to do that with Jesus. This This isn't one sighting of Jesus in a dark alley on a crowded street. Uh, this isn't the kind of appearances that Jesus made to the disciples. No, they saw Him many times. Uh, they saw Him at various hours of the day. They saw Him in various circumstances and places. Uh, this, is, this is something that was proven to them. Notice that this context says as well that they handled Him. Our hands have handled of the word of life in verse 1. And so I don't know what Thomas did, but at some point they handled him. At some point they touched him. At some point they were firmly convinced uh, that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now the testimony of the apostles to the resurrection of Jesus uh, is a very important thing. And the fact that it took place over 40 days is extremely significant. And it's extremely significant because with every time that they see Jesus, they have the opportunity after He is gone to think about what they've seen and then to devise a new test, a new way of examining Him. Maybe after Jesus is gone from them, they sit and they talk about, I touched His hand. 
or I, I saw the wound, or, or I saw this, or I saw that, and, and they consult about what they've seen. And maybe someone, uh, maybe even Thomas says, well, what about this? I wonder about this. Or I'd like to know this. And so the next time Jesus is there, they have the opportunity to find that out, to be firmly convinced that he had been raised from the dead. Now, the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead and that they firmly believed that showed that Jesus was the Son of God. It showed that he was not a blasphemer as he had been accused of being. For if he had been a blasphemer, God would not have raised him from the dead. So by the fact that he was walking around shows that he was a man who was approved of God. Let's talk about some confirmed prophecies, and we've got to go go quickly if we're going to uh, get very far into this. But notice in Acts chapter 2, on Pentecost Day, when Peter's preaching this message in Acts chapter 2, that Peter is firmly convinced of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has seen these infallible proofs. He spent 40 days with Jesus examining him, and there's not a doubt in the heart of Peter about the resurrection of Jesus. And that's extremely important. Because if you're going to preach on the resurrection of Jesus, you need to believe it with all of your heart. Because if you don't believe it with all of your heart, it's going to show in the way that you, pre- you preach it or you present it. If there's questions out there about it, and that will be evident. It will rob your preaching of the power that it needs to have. But there was not any doubt on the part of Peter. Notice in verse 29 of Acts chapter 2, he's already talked about the death of Jesus. He says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Now, I picture it this way. It may not have been this way, but I picture it this way. David, he's dead, he's buried, and his sepulcher is with us to this day. Peter has the opportunity to point in the distance to the sepulcher of David. You know, David, he died, he was buried. That's where he's buried, right over there. That's what Peter's saying. But notice as we continue down through the context, it says, Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God hath sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Peter says, David, the very David that's buried right over there, spoke of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, this is infallible proofs, that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He said, you need to be firmly convinced, fully convinced, Jesus has been raised from the dead. It's interesting that David says that David's still over there. David has not ascended into the heavens. What Peter is saying is, if I want to, I can go get David's bones out. And that is an open challenge to them. Why don't someone go get the body of Jesus? You know, Peter's preaching the resurrection of Jesus. What is the easiest, the quickest way to disprove that Jesus has been raised from the dead? Simply to produce his body. That's all you got to do. You produce his body. If the Jews could have gone, if the Pharisees could have gone, gathered up the body of Jesus and dropped it right there in front of Peter, Peter couldn't have convinced a single person in that whole audience that Jesus was raised from the dead. It would have been over. Christianity would have died right there had that been done. But they couldn't produce the body of Jesus because the body wasn't there to get. And as a result of that, the apostles continued to preach and they continued to be unable to give the proof that Jesus remained in the tomb. This is convincing Convincing evidence, confirmed prophecies here, courageous preaching. When you think about the apostles and their preaching, 
Throughout the book of Acts, what they're preaching is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, As they spoke unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people, and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What they're preaching in every sermon is the resurrection of Jesus. Men don't like to hear that, especially the Sadducees. They don't believe in a resurrection at all, much less the resurrection of Jesus. The Pharisees don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, even though they do believe in the general resurrection. Both of them are opposed to this preaching. They threaten the apostles. They put them in prison. They even beat them. But what do the apostles continue to do? Preach and teach the resurrection. Why do you think they're doing that? They're doing that because they're convinced. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. There's no doubt in their minds. There's no other way to account for their courage than the fact that they knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. But let's talk about the compelling power of the resurrection. We'll have to very quickly get through this. You know, the book of Acts reveals that the resurrection changed those that heard it, but it also changed those that preached it. Those that preached the resurrection, it changed them. Those that heard the resurrection, it changed them. That's the power behind the resurrection. The fact that that disciples are multiplying through the book of Acts shows the compelling power that's connected with the resurrection. But maybe one of the ones that stands out in my mind is Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, where it says, A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith in Acts chapter 6 and verse 7. Now, of all the people that would have been hard to convince, it seems to me that these individuals would have been hard to convince. They've got a lot to lose. If the resurrection is true, and if they come out and they say, we believe that the resurrection is true, what do you think happened to them? You think the Jewish people said, oh, that's okay, you just go right on being our priest. You just go on right, right on offering sacrifices for us. No, the day that they made that declaration, the day that they obeyed the gospel, they didn't have a job to go back to. They gave it up. They walked away from it. Now, if you were a priest, that was important in Jewish society. That was a special thing. It was something that had been true for generations. You were breaking tradition with your your whole family's history when you left that and walked away from that. But they did that because they were so firmly convinced of it. But think about it as well. Well, let's know Matthew 28, verse 11. We've got time to. Matthew 28, verse 11, to show how hard these individuals would have been to, to convince. Matthew 28, verse 11. It says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. Now here are the priests, and they say, when they're told exactly what happened, here, we'll give you some money not to tell this. And if you get in any trouble... With your military commanders, you let us know and we'll handle it for you. We'll take care of it. But whatever the case, don't let this story get out. Don't let anyone know what really happened. They're covering it up. And yet it was some some of the priests who later were convinced. But if there were no other proof for the resurrection than Saul of Tarsus, that would be pretty compelling proof, wouldn't it? That this man who had persecuted Christians, who had persecuted the church, became so fully convinced of the resurrection, having seen the resurrected Lord, that he would turn from the way that he had always lived and that his fathers had always lived and he would go a different direction and he would suffer greatly for that change. He would count all things but loss to be able to preach and teach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he would go from a blasphemer to a believer and from a persecutor to a preacher based on what he saw on that road to Damascus. He was fully convinced that Jesus had been raised from the dead. There was no denying it. He kicked against the pricks. Finally, when he stood there 
before the Lord. There was no way to kick against it anymore. And so he obeyed the gospel and he spent the rest of his life declaring the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention this morning.